my name is, uh, should I go ahead and start? Uh, okay, great. My name is Rudd Simmons, and uh, I have Edward here, Edward Stencil, to thank for the name of the seminar today. Um, I'm, I'm curious, who here is a filmmaker? Edward is? Uh, I'm like a half. You're half a filmmaker? <laughs> <laughs> Partial. Partial filmmaker? filmmaker? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Um, I'm a producer by trade, and uh, I produce feature films. And some of the films that I've done before, I did um, the Cormac McCarthy, The Road. I did the first uh, season of Boardwalk Empire for HBO. Uh, I've done two Wes Anderson movies, Royal Tenenbaums, uh, The Life Aquatic. I did a Beatles musical called um, Across the Universe with Julie Taymor. And I kind of go way back to Dead Man Walking with mm -hmm. Susan Sarandon. And I've done a couple of Stephen Frears' movies, High Fidelity. And then I started with an independent director that you may or may not have heard of, Jim Jarmusch. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I made, I started a documentary about five years ago and finished it last year. It's called The First Season. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about how I made the documentary as um, uh, how I approached the making of the documentary and the decisions that I made as a feature filmmaker. Uh, a lot of documentaries I know are made by journalists or, um, or television journalists or activists. Uh, I approached it in a completely different way. And I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at that because a lot of times, you know, we look at documentaries and we think that's real. You know, that's the real world up on the screen. And we look at feature films and we think, well, that's a fictional world up on the screen. And I think we're all aware of the choices that fictional directors make with music and lighting schemes, um, all of those choices that end up creating that world on the screen. We may not be aware of some of the subtler choices that documentary filmmakers make. Now, everyone who's seen a Michael Moore documentary knows that there's a style there, you know. Everyone who's seen an Errol Morris film knows that there's a style there and that what you're seeing is from their point of view. But when we look at documentaries like Frontline, which is a wonderful series, we watch Frontline and, you know, what we're seeing, what we think we're seeing is truth. And because you have this impression that there's investigative journalism, and now we're laying out these facts one by one. But if you look at Frontline, it's the same narrator all the time, who has a very kind of moderated voice, and it's very calm, and he's literally laying down the facts one by one. That's a stylistic choice. So what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about what I do as a producer, and then uh, show you clips uh, from uh, the film, uh, the first season, and kind of talk about the decisions that I made uh, to put it together. And first of all, I wanted to pass these out. There won't be a test, so don't worry. Uh, this is a synopsis and an act breakdown of the first season. Now, you know, you look at this, and I'm sure that, you know, documentary filmmakers, I'm not Documentary filmmakers don't do that. And as a matter of fact, you know, if we read through it, I'll read through it real quick. There's no facts, there are no figures. You know, we're not talking about themes, we're not talking about issues. This is really what a, scre a, a screenplay, a breakdown of a screenplay would be like. Now, you know, I didn't put this together in the beginning. This actually took five years to write, uh, and we'll get into that in a minute. But synopsis, uh, Paul and Phyllis Van Amberg buy a dairy farm and struggle to become full-time farmers. Mm -hmm. Now, as we went through the editing phase, that became the story. And, as, and we'll go to that in a minute. That became the story, and this kind of became our Bible. Anything that didn't fit that one sentence was ended up, we took it out of the movie. Act one, introduction setup, which was 24 minutes long. Now, the timing is important because if you look at a feature film, let's talk about a 90 minute feature film because you know the doc is 84, but a 90 minute feature film 
you can break down into three acts, which is kind of a, a classic Greek structure. You can actually break it down into five, but for general terms, we'll say three. And if you look at a screenplay, you'll notice, it, well, if you break down the acts of a 90-minute film, it's usually 20 minutes for the first act, 20 minutes for the last act, and you know, roughly 50 minutes, 55 minutes for the second act. And you'll also notice that around those times, so if you're watching a 90 minute feature, around 20 minutes in, something will happen that spins the story off into the second act. Uh, and then somewhere around, you know, somewhere around 20, uh, around 75 minutes in, there will be another event that happens that spins it off. And then the third act is a resolution. So, First act in a feature is usually uh, the introduction of all the characters, and then at the end of that, something happens, some conflict happens coming out of that, that becomes the second act. And in the second act, you have conflict, conflict, conflict that's developed, and then in the third act, these conflicts are resolved. And uh, a lot of times when screenwriters sit down and write a screenplay, they actually plan that out with cards. So what we did in the editing room is we created uh, an index card for every scene in the film. And we actually took a, a screen still from the scene, put it on the card, put a description on it, and put it up on the board. And we started with every scene in the film that we were going to have and slowly took it away. And then we also, knowing that this was going to be around a 90 minute film, we put the timeline up so that, you know, 90 minute film, it's roughly you know, 15 minutes for the first act, it's roughly an hour for the second act, and roughly 15 minutes for the third act. And we had that up there, you know, of where we wanted these acts to fall. So, act one, introduction setup, which is in the finished film, is 24 minutes long. Believing that a small family farm is the best place <coughs> to raise their family, Paul and Phyllis leave their jobs, sell their home, and go into debt to buy a defunct dairy. With three children and a fourth on the way, they struggle to get their dairy operational before the herd begins to calve. In other words, before the herd calves start getting bored. Now, again, you know, this is not, it has, oh, I'm sorry. It says nothing about sustainability. It says nothing about organic, which is going to be in the film. It says nothing about the politics of small-time farming. It says nothing about the economics of small-time farming. I approach the story totally from a human point of view. And then act two, toiling against increasingly long hours, harsh weather conditions, illness, and death within their cattle herd, the Van Ambergs fight the odds to begin turning a profit before their savings expire. Finally, as the summer draws to a close, they make just enough money to pay their monthly expenses. Now, what happens in the second act of the movie is the way we structured it is there are three milk pickups. The truck comes, picks the milk up, gives the Van Amberg's money. Every time that happens, that's the end of uh, a piece of that second act, a third of that second act. And then finally, act three, which is always the resolution of the conflict, with the hard-earned knowledge from their first season's experience, the Van Ambergs accept that farming is, at best, a break-even endeavor, and with the birth of a newborn son, prepare to continue on for another year. So, I mean, now, that's the story. And so let me back up a little bit. Um, and I should actually explain what I do as a producer. Um, when, when we see a feature film, you see like 10, 15, 20 credits on it for you know producer. It used to be in the old days, in the studio system, uh, back in the 30s and the 40s, that the person who owned and ran the studio was the producer, David O. Selzman, for instance. And that person had total <coughs> creative control over every aspect of the making of the movies that they made, from the selection of the material to the development of the scripts, even down to the buttons on the wardrobe. Directors were hired, they came in, they were given, usually they came in on the morning of. Here's your script, this is what you're shooting today. The director shot the movie and then went away and did something else and the producer edited it. That time is a long time ago. 
as with everything in the modern world, producers today are specialized. Um, because of the nature of the business, it's very difficult for one individual to do more than one, maybe two aspects of making a movie. Uh, there are a handful of people that can do it. Scott Rudin, for instance, is a producer in the old sense of the word. Um, so now you have producers that only raise money for movies. You have producers who only give money for, produce, for, for productions. You have producers who develop scripts. You have producers who oversee production. You have producers who oversee distribution. And you have, you have producers that put together packages of talent. And the, it's so difficult today to get a movie made, and it takes so much time that most producers have 10, 15, 20 projects all going at the same time. And it's really only what they can do is what they specialize in. I, when I produce a movie, I oversee, uh, we'll say I oversee the production. I usually come in when there is a director on. And the director hires me, and the studio is the one who actually pays me. Now, the studio, they look to me to oversee budget, oversee all the physical aspects of making the movie. The director looks to me to make sure we're making the best movie, the movie that he or she wants to make for the amount of money that we have. So when, when I come in to do a movie, and it usually starts before we have a script, um, I work with the director to make sure that I can get into the head of the director, understand their vision, and then make sure that everybody from production, de uh, production designer down to editor, the gaffer, everybody, make sure that that person is doing what the director wants. It's amazing how many stories you can get it's amazing how many different opinions you can get once you get a group of people together. Um, and then when we run into problems, it's my job to actually work with the director to come up with solutions. So I'm involved literally in every aspect of making the movie and deal with all of that. Um, those choices that a director makes, yes? Quick, uh, how, how do you get to that position of where you're at? Did you come up, did you go to school for that? Did you, did yeah, you I, you know, I came out of a working class background in Virginia. My okay. father works in the shipyard down there. And I, um, having failed everything else I was trying to do, fell in love with the movies. And uh, not really having any connection whatsoever uh, to uh, filmmaking. Uh, went to NYU, came up and went to graduate school at NYU to, through their film production program. and. I think the most important thing that I got out of film school was a community to work within. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, when they ask me, is it worth it, I say, you know, today you can learn the language of filmmaking off of DVDs. And the equipment is so accessible now that you really don't need the technical expertise mm -hmm. that Lee was talking about. Um, the one thing, though, that film school gives you is a community, which you have to have in making so for me, NYU was my community. And I was very fortunate in that Jim Jarmusch, Spike Lee, Barry Sonnenfeld, um, the Coen brothers were all at school at the same time I was. So we went to school together, we came out, we started working together. And you know, then I just kind of gradually went up the ranks and um, until I'm doing what I do today. Um, so anyway, so the choices that a director makes, whether they are, whether you're going to shoot on digital or shoot on film, whether, um, uh, you know, it was like what Lee was talking about, you're going with the uh, plastic color of the corporate world or whether or not you want to have natural color. Those are all choices a director makes to create the world that you end up seeing on screen. But what does a documentary director do? You know, I mean, Doctor, documentaries, you think, well, you know, all they really do is they turn on the camera and um, record reality, you know, and then they structure it. Well, when I made this film, the way, the way it came to be is Paul and Phyllis Van Amberg, um, I knew uh, from upstate New York, 
And Paul was a construction contractor. Phyllis worked as an occupational therapist. Through a number of things that happened, they were fed up with the uh, suburban life that they had. And they really felt that they wanted to get their kids away from the mall culture and from television. And they wanted to take a step back a couple of generations. They wanted to buy a dairy farm. They wanted to raise their children on the farm, which also meant that their children were involved 24-7 with them and they were, were involved 24-7 with their kids. They didn't want the traditional walls that we live in. I'm gonna get up in the morning, go to work, kids go to school, I come home, I have supper with the kids, hopefully put the kids to bed. Tomorrow we get up and do it all over again. They wanted direct contact and involvement in their kids' life. Now, in order to do that, um, they also believed in the sustainability model. They're very much a part of the back to earth or back to the, uh, the rural area of the agrarian movement. Um, those are all things that they're very, very passionate about. So they were having dinner over at our house one night and they, they said, you know, well, we're gonna buy a farm. You know, we're, we're quitting our jobs, we're moving out to the country. We've taken out a half million dollar loan. You know, we're selling our house. And my wife and I were horrified. Oh my <laughs> God, you've got to be out of your mind. And they are very, very strong little people. And of course, you know, they went ahead to do what they were going to do. Anyway, I got up the next morning and I started thinking, you know, this might make a really interesting film. Now, for years, I've been very fortunate in that I work with a lot of really interesting directors. And I have an opportunity to work very closely with them and get into their head and be part of their vision. Um, and I hadn't really thought about whether or not I wanted to do my own film or not. You know, it was almost as if what I do takes care of that, scratches that itch. But a couple of years ago, my wife started saying, well, you know, are you giving up a dream? Are you gonna get old and wish you had made your own movie? And, and at a certain point in time, it started to dawn on me, just because I make a movie doesn't necessarily mean I'm a professional director. I have a career. I have a job I like. But if I find something I want to make a movie about, the, the means are so accessible these days, then I should just do it. It's kind of an exciting idea. So when Paul and Phyllis you know, thought about this, I, we get up the next morning, and my wife said, you know, that would make a really interesting film. And we started talking about it because if you look at what they were presenting, they're both incredibly, as you'll see, both incredibly charismatic, articulate, passionate people. And they have a marriage that is so like a team, it's amazing. So they're really interesting and they have chemistry. Now, I think that in, in filmmaking, uh, in filmmaking, casting is 85% of the film. If you have two actors that have screen presence and have, um, and have a chemistry with each other, that is gonna overcome so many technical issues, so many story issues. If you look at a movie, who's seen High Fidelity? Anybody seen High Fidelity? Okay. Do you like it? Who's that? Yeah. yeah. Do you like it? Oh, yeah. Do you like it? Yeah. Well, you look, at, you look at High Fidelity, and if, if you kind of look at it, it, it doesn't work in a lot of ways. You know, the story never really pays off. Um, it's kind of a male confessional that doesn't really have a dramatic arc, so it's not really emotionally satisfying. The, the girlfriend is really kind of strange, you know, it's, and there's no chemistry at all between the two of them. However, Cusack is so appealing and is so charismatic that you forget all of that stuff. It's just wonderful to see him come out and talk to you. So I think that in, in casting a feature, uh, a fiction film, 85% at least. However, in a documentary, I think it's much more than that, 90, 95%, especially in a film like this. Because if you have, and I'll show you some examples, if you have really interesting people that are accessible to the camera and that have an interesting relationship. We as an audience will put up with out of focus shots, you know, we'll put up with bad 
dialogue track will put up with a lot because they're so compelling. So as I'm thinking about this, Paul and Phyllis casting. That's good. Two, theme. Now, the small farm has been very, very much a part of, come on in, guys. Thanks. Very, very much a part of the uh, American experience for as, as go all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. And as a matter of fact, the image of the small farm changes with, according to what's going on in our country. This is, um, this is kind of a structural uh, breakdown of the film we're talking about. Um, you know, if you look, at, you look at the small farm in the Depression, for instance, and you have this image of um, just empty, empty landscape. Um, the small farm was, was an image of just destruction back during the Depression. You look in the 70s, and the small farm was kind of a commune. You know, it was a hippie. It was back to earth. <laughs> you know, and then recently, the small farm has become kind of, in the 50s, and I see it happening again, it, it's become kind of, it, it, it embodies traditional values, you know, thrift, hard work, uh, family oriented, um, the belief that if you work really hard and if you work smart, you can own your own land and be your own boss. So I thought, you know, that's, that's resonating. Those themes really resonate, I think, with a lot of what's going on in the country right now. So we have casting, we have theme. Then I started thinking structure. Well, if I follow them for their first year, then automatically we have an act structure built into no matter what happens because you have the change of season. And a farmer's life is outdoors. So I can use the change of season as a, 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 a way to structure the acts and even use landscape shots between what's going on for a passage of time. Also, uh, the very nature of starting an enterprise, whether or not it's a farm or, or a small family business, whatever, means that there's going to be conflict. So we didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew something was going to happen. So there you have casting, you have theme, you have structure. So then I started thinking, OK, if I do this, what am I interested in? What am I interested in? What story am I interested in telling? And I, I like all the intellectual things that you know, the story would have, but as a feature filmmaker, what I'm most interested in is the emotional element. I mean, you know, for whatever reason, we approach, we access fiction on an emotional level. We don't expect our fiction films to really have any intellectual ideas. I remember my brother is a carpenter, and I remember talking to him about Star Wars one time. You know, and uh, I was saying, but don't you see Joseph Campbell and the journey and the Arturian legend? And he was going, what are you, out of your mind? It's a bunch of men in space shoots just <laughs> shooting at each other. Yeah. You know, so we, we really, we access, the, uh, we actually access fiction on an emotional level, and we access documentaries on an intellectual basis. You know, we sit there when we watch a documentary, and we don't expect to have an experience. We don't expect to experience a story like we do with fiction. We, ex we expect to be told a story that we then think about. Whether or not there are intellectual ideas and facts and figures coming to us or not, we expect in documentaries to have interviews and we expect to be told the story and we're following it with our heads. Well, why does that have to be? I mean, you know, there was a whole movement back in the 60s and early 70s of cinema verite. Who knows what cinema verite is? Cinema verite is a style of filmmaking that we now associate with um, the deadliest catch, for instance. If you took the interviews out of those kinds of shows, that's cinema verite. In other words, cinema verite, uh, it, it, it has a, a, another title in Europe called direct cinema was the idea that if you sit there with the camera and record life, that is more interesting and truthful than if you impose a narration. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to get into whether or not it's more truthful, because my feeling is it's just another way to tell a story. You know? But there was huge debates about this. So I was thinking, if 
You shoot this in a cinema verite style. In other words, camera on shoulder, follow these people around. No script. No script. Whatever happens is going to happen. Then use whatever technique I can to remove the fourth wall. Who knows what the fourth wall is? In theater, there's a concept called the fourth wall. It's also in movies. And the idea is that you have a stage, right? A stage has three walls. Then you have the fourth wall, which is really right where the, the arc of the proscenium is. That disappears because you are buying into the illusion of whatever is happening on stage or happening on the screen. So the fourth wall concept is that when you make a movie or you make a play, um, the audience is going and what they're doing is they are accepting that what they're seeing in front of them is real. And they're experiencing it in the same way that the people on the screen are experiencing it. We as human beings have this amazing um, talent. Everybody has it. It's called empathy. And empathy means that you actually feel what other people feel. And the way it works is it doesn't work with what people say. It works with body language. It works with inflection. It works with the way people use their words, how they say them, how they're breathing at the time, how me, how I might project on you, what's happening to you as I'm watching you. And because of that talent, we have this ability to watch movies and watch plays and be in the moment be actually there with the actors, experiencing what's happening with the actors. Now, why can't that happen with documentaries? You know, why can't we also experience the world in that way? So, when I called Phyllis and, and Paul up, I said, let me make a movie about you guys. I just want to follow you for a year. I won't be in your way. This is what I want to do. This is what I'm interested in. And they said, okay, let's do it. So the idea was that I would follow them for their first season. And I would just shoot anything that was interesting. And uh, take that material back into an editing room and then shape it into a narrative. Now, in following it, it meant I was doing a lot of stuff that was incredibly boring. I would shoot endless scenes of milking, you know, of calves being bored. You know, the, the rules that we had was, I would always follow the story through their point of view. In other words, I would, it would always be one of them in the scene, either one of them. So I would never leave the farm unless they left, because they're my main characters. The other rule is that when I have the camera on my shoulder, they just pretend I'm not there. They do what they're going to do, I do what I do. And interestingly enough, after about three days, that happened. Um, and then I shot. I shot for a year. I went off and did a job. I came back. I shot more. What I started worrying about, though, is that the material wasn't really strong enough. I didn't have faith in what I was doing. So I started doing interviews. And I thought, if I need them, they'll be there. So after about three years of this, I felt like I can't do this anymore. You know, I'm, and if I don't finish it now, then I'm going to lose momentum, and it's never going to get done. So I hired an editor, and we took all the material, it was about 110 hours, and we, everything that was technically really, really bad, in other words, not usable at all, we threw away. Mm -hmm. Then he took all that material and assembled scenes. A scene would be, you know, Phyllis comes in, washes the dishes, goes up the room. A scene would be Phyllis Milk's cows goes up the road. So we put all that together, and we strung it together in chronological order, and uh, we had six hours. So that in and of itself took six months. Then what we started doing is we looked at the material and we thought, what's the strongest? What works the best? And anything that didn't really work very well, we took out. And then we looked at the material and we thought, what's extraneous? And we took that out. So this was a matter of distillation, starting with all this stuff, and then we distilled it down. Now, we have these scenes, and we started playing around on our bulletin board. You know, what makes the best narrative? And, you know, we had a chronology. 
In other words, you start, you finish. But we needed certain scenes to tell the story, so we started moving things out of chronology. And then we needed certain scenes, and so we made them up. In other words, we took an interview and we turned it into a dialogue scene. We, the only rule that we had was it had to work and it had to be true to the spirit of the story and true to the spirit of what Paul and Phyllis were trying to do. Outside that, yes? When you say that it had to be true to the story, at what point did you come to decide or realize what the story actually was? Because sometimes it's not until after the fact that exactly, you really see that. Exactly, exactly. We were really lucky because, you know, I had the original idea, which is I wanted to basically tell the story of trying to get this enterprise off the ground. And what we found is once we put it all together, that was the strongest in the, in the footage. That material was stronger than anything else. And so that's what the story became. Now, a lot of times, a very good point, because a lot of times in that matter, you'll get into it, and all of a sudden you'll realize, oh my god, what I'm, what I'm making a movie about here has nothing to do with what I started. And I was prepared, actually, to think, okay, the, the struggle of making the farm wasn't going to be strong enough, and I need to now go out and shoot interviews and do whatever was strong. But that never happened. Um, what we found is that emotionally, some of the scenes weren't strong enough, or there needed to be more explanation in the beginning of where these people were coming from. Uh, and that's when we started taking some of those interviews and using them. That's when music started to be used. Um, now, you know, can you use music in a documentary? You know, there used to be a huge debate. There really isn't anymore. I think you can use anything in a documentary as long as it's true to the material that you're doing. Um, in the film itself, there are two short interviews in the very beginning and one short interview in the end. That's it. Um, now, one of the things that I had decided in the very beginning is how I wanted it to look. Um, I wanted an audience to experience this as a story. I wanted them to feel that this was a story about people they were watching. I didn't want them to feel that it was journalism. I didn't want them to feel that this was in any way, shape, or form news. So the camera that I chose shot true 24 frame. Now, this was five years ago. So you know, in the digital age these days, this is old technology. But for me then, this was the same frame rate that film is, which means there's a slight blur. It's a little soft. But it doesn't have that crisp, hard edge that video does. Also, the camera that I used had 720 whatever, 720p, 720i, as opposed to 1080, which means that the resolution is not that crisp. So I made a decision to take all the edges off because I wanted it to look like film so that an audience would feel that this was not a quote unquote documentary. Um, in addition to that, um, in addition to that, the shooting style was that I wanted the shooting style to be as organic as possible. So, in other words, if, if I'm shooting, you know, the two of you are having a conversation, I, I would start with a two shot, and then maybe you're talking and I would move in on you, and then I move over to you for a reaction shot. But feeling the scene as I'm watching it, what kind of coverage needs to be there with the hopes that we could actually cut using the full shot as opposed to cutaway to cutaways, or cut out to cutaways. If you look at a movie, uh, <clears throat> sometimes a director will let a scene play out in one shot. And when it works, it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Because you may not notice it, but you feel that what you're seeing in front of you is real, that those emotions are real. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was hoping to do with the film itself, is by limiting the number of cuts, you feel as if the story is unfolding in front of you as opposed to being manipulated. Now, when we were in our color correction stage, uh, the, the uh, technician told me that most feature films that come in today 
have somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000, 2,500 cuts for a 90 minute film. Our film has 473. Mm -hmm. So there's a fluidity of things that are happening. It's also the pace is a little bit slower, but once you accept that as an audience, there are things that happen that you pick up that kicks off that empathy gene, you know, and it pulls you in. Um, why don't we do this? Can we play the, let's play the trailer. It could, could um, how do I hit the lights? I will get hang on just a second. Let me, I just want to play the trailer because nobody's seen the film, so I think this will at least give you an idea. Got off the uh, source here. Come on, VGA is what we want. You went into standby mode. <laughs> if it doesn't play it for a while, well, it right. goes to, you know, tries to. Now, again, you know, this is, this is not something that, you know, we didn't cut the trailer until at the very end of our post-production period. I couldn't have made a trailer because I didn't know what the story was going to be. You know, and the editing period was truly a phase of distillation. Because what happened too is we would bring people in toward the end when we thought we'd get to a place in the editing we thought, okay, I can't do anymore. You know, I've done everything I can think of. We'd bring in maybe three people and we'd show them the movie and then talk to them about where their questions were. What did, what didn't work. What I found, interestingly enough, is that if they had questions about a scene, more nine times out of 10, it wasn't that the scene had not enough information, it had too much information. Because what would happen is too much information would lead them to another narrative. So for instance, if we have a dialogue scene, and Paul and Phyllis are talking about the price of milk or something, and you know, they stop talking and then Phyllis says, well, it's a good thing we're going organic because now we have a more milk money coming in. Well, if I left the organic part in, the audience would think, well, I don't understand, you know, because they wanted more about the organic. If I took the uh, organic part of the conversation out, the question didn't exist. So it was really a matter of, of distilling down what the very essence was. And where we came to is that one sentence at the top of the page. You know, which is, you know, all of this is basically just very straightforward. We had it earlier. Sorry. Did you finance this yourself, or at what point did you go out and raise money for the film? Yeah, I did finance it myself. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I shot the movie myself, I did re recorded all the sound myself. So the actual expenses of shooting the film were minuscule. Mm -hmm. I think my most expensive thing is I bought the camera. Mm -hmm. um, then, once we started in post, that's when I hired an editor, you know, and um, I was able to finagle some editing space, and, but then also, at a certain point, I realized we really needed music, and I brought in a composer, and, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But up until then, and I, I decided that I didn't want to go for outside financing because, you know, this was a movie that I was making, and I may never, never get a chance to do something like this again. Mm -hmm. And that I knew that if I went in to like HBO or TBS, that they would want certain ideas about how they wanted it. And that's kind of what I do in my day job. Mm -hmm. So I basically, you know, of course now I'm in the process of trying to find a distributor, so it's a whole other story. Yeah, well, works up on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, come to the come to the distribution. <laughs> yeah, the the thing. yeah. So um, when you were, uh, you know, deciding to do this, um, did you have an end game in mind when you thought, "Wow, this is a great story, and I, I want to flex this muscle and be able to, you know, because I understand that." Um, was there an end game other than the production of this itself? Was it, I want to sell this, I want to do this with it? Well, actually, you know, that's an interesting question, and it goes a little further, a little deeper than I think what the initial question is. Because I was at a screening a, a while back, and, and during the Q&A, somebody raised their hand, and they said, what is your, what do you want to, what do, you want to do with this? You know, and I said, I want to make a million dollars. No, and he said, well, what, what was your intent? 
And the intent, you know, I said, well, you know, I, what I wanted to do was I want, oh, we lost the site, yeah. It was, it was Trailer Park, wasn't it? It wasn't YouTube. Yeah, it was Trailer Park. Trailer yeah. Park, yeah. Uh, I said that, you know, well, what I, uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to put a face on the American yeah. farmer so that when you open up the newspaper and you read the paper, you know, you will think of Paul and Phyllis and maybe the story will hit you a little bit deeper. You know, and then I started thinking, well, you know, that all sounds nice and that's what documentaries all say, but it's bullshit. I mean, basically, I thought, these are compelling people. This is an interesting story. This could be a lot of fun as a how, filmmaker. And how much of it came down to the ability to control that story yourself as you opposed to working with the other directors and other people? That's what I was really interested in. See, yeah. You know, what I was really interested in is putting myself in a situation that I had absolutely no control. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew that I had the structure. Mm -hmm. I cast it, I knew what the structure of the story was gonna be, I knew something was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And I kind of fought it, too, because I kept trying to get them, you know, hey, why don't you guys bring the family together and talk about the finances or what? Because the movie never had a natural ending. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I started feeling, you know, you just have to stand back and let it go. And that's really hard, because you're in the field and you're doing this and you have no idea whether any of this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And for every scene that you shoot and you capture, you feel like there's a hundred others that are more important than you've missed. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge amount of doubt. But that was the reason that I wanted to do this, is I wanted to go into a situation that I had no control over and just let it unfold. Mm -hmm. And then take what the footage was and have the footage dictate what the movie was gonna be about. Which is uh, the reason I didn't go after financiers. Mm -hmm. Because they would have then controlled what the movie was gonna be about. Right. <coughs> Should we, uh, <coughs> we're, 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 they'll get it, they'll get it. He's in the history here. Um, what wow, was it? Where's that? Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, try that. Yeah. You might have talked about this before we got in, so I apologize, but yeah. did you know um, Paul and Phyllis before you Yes, doing yeah, this? the way this, the way this, did I, did you come in when I told you how the whole genesis of the idea came about? No, so you don't you have to repeat that. No, 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 no. I, uh, no, I, I got a field time here. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, I, I knew Paul and Phyllis. And, and Paul was a construction contractor, and Phyllis was an occupational therapist. And they lived in the suburbs outside of Albany. And they had decided that they were tired of raising their family in quote unquote mall culture, suburban culture. They wanted to go back a couple of generations and, and raise their family on the farm. Uh, and so they came to dinner one night and told us that they were going to do that. And so the next day, I called them up and I said, let me make a film about this. Let me follow you guys. And the, the reason was, I know that they're very compelling. And I knew that they would be really good on camera, which is casting, which is, you know, 95% of making a good documentary. Um, I knew that there was themes which is the, the whole theme of the American farm and self-sustainability and basically taking your fate in your hands, which can relate to anybody. I knew that there was a structure in the first year and that visually the acts could be delineated with the change of the seasons. Um, and so for me, that was a compelling enough reason to make the story. And what I was interested in is uh, is that okay? Yeah, we want to we want to go full screen. Sure. Oh, the yeah. Yeah, you oh, can right. just yeah, the screen in the right. 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 So let's kill the lights, um, and this will give you an idea of what we're talking about. I hope. Do we lose it? Now this is this is going to be a little soft because we're pulling it off of uh, a site and kind of blowing up the image, and you'll see the difference once we put the DVD in. That's my fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's all right. No, it's not. Yeah. That was my suggestion. Is to I'm missed to get into this game. Okay, it's just slow. Yeah, it's HD. Oh, well, you know what? I, let's just take it off. Let's not worry about this. Uh, and let's just go straight to the. Uh, Let it buffer, and then we'll play it in five minutes. Just put it on pause. Yeah. Okay, it'll, it'll, it'll buffer up. And let's go to uh, let's go to the DVD. Um, now, while he's setting up the DVD, uh, so we put the movie together. We had the three act structure, but the first act was too long. And no matter what we did, we couldn't shorten the first act. And if you look at the, the breakdown, you see the first act is 24 minutes long, and the last act is something like 12. This is how it ended up. This is how they ended up, based on the footage that we had. So what that meant is that the first conflict in the film comes 24 minutes in. Up until 24 minutes, it's explanation of who they are, what they wanted to do, where they are, um, you know, what the farm is. That's an awful long time for an audience to sit there and wait for some kind of drama to happen. So, I built a teaser. Now, most feature films these days, yeah, you know, most feature films these days will have a title sequence. And in the title sequence, you'll see the star running through the streets and it's all exciting and everything and then, you know, something happens and then, boom, screen goes black. Now, you're hooked. I mean, you'll sit there for the next 10 minutes and listen to exposition up the wazoo to wait and see what happened uh, from, the, from the very beginning. So, um, so we started playing around with some ideas. And we came up with the teaser idea. And so we'll, you mean you uh, built the teaser into the movie? Into the we built the teaser into the first, yeah. Yeah, we built the teaser into the first. That's great. Can we go back to the game? We built the teaser into the movie. And you know, in the beginning, people said, oh, that, you know, that doesn't work, it's, it's too long. And let's go all the way back. And so, you know, true to form, you know, they were saying it's too long. So I thought, oh, let's turn off the lights, and this is the first thing that comes up. Let's go back to the very beginning. And turn the sound down a little bit, and I'll talk you through this. And I'll, I'll kind of talk you through what the intention was and show you what it is that we did. So, you know, the first act actually starts, let's hold on just a second. The first act actually starts with that bright sunny day of the field. That's when the story actually starts. All of this really doesn't have much to do with the story itself, but it does set a mood and a tone. Now, I was trying desperately to stay away from voiceover, but at the beginning of the summer, I went back and I looked at all of Terrence Malick's movies, and in the thin red line, I noticed that what he was doing is he had his soldiers in that movie go through their day-to-day -day life and the battles that they were fighting and all of that, but there was this disconnected voiceover that he was using, <coughs> that he would be on a character, and the character is doing something, and rather than the voiceover talking about what it was he was doing, the, the character in a disembodied voice was talking about some philosophical issue. And I started thinking, you know, usual documentary tradition is that you start with a voiceover, or you start with an interview, and then that continues with voiceover. But at least you start with the interview and then you know who's talking. Or you start with a voiceover and you end it with an interview. And I thought, what if we just kind of got rid of it all? And what if, the, what, if the end, what if the voiceover doesn't really tell us any information, but it tells us about how the character's feeling? And so we started playing around with that, and we ended up using it in every act of change where there is a, either Paul or Phyllis completely disembodied, you never see them talk. But, and it came from an interview that I did about two years after we shot the film and Paul was incredibly depressed because everything was going really terrible. So now, first of all, we completely desaturated the color. So it appears almost as if it's black and white. We wanted this landscape to be as harsh as possible. 
so that you wouldn't really know what was going on and you had this sense of danger. The other thing is we're starting it with an abstract image. You know, when you first see this image, what you really see are the lines. You see, you know, you see this, you know, and these two white connections. So you have no idea what this is. And then you hear a bird, which is something that we added in to all of a sudden, okay, well, maybe it's natural. So let's go ahead and play, and I'll talk through it. So at opening image, you have no idea what's going on. You hear wind, there's a bird. Then we cut to this, still an abstract image, but maybe this makes a little more sense that off in the distance you hear music. Again, now this is more of a narrative and there's a house. So your brain starts putting together a narrative and now there's a farm in the background. And it's, it's clearly a rural scene. But you're not sure what this music is and it just kind of floats. So now in, into the barn and we're now moving into the story. So your mind is now starting to think, oh, I see, this is going to be about a farm. Well, first season, now you're in the barn. And you're adding in the sound of machinery, because we know the barn is a factory. All this is enhanced. So now you're thinking, oh, OK, it's about dairy farm. This is our Rosemary's baby shop. Right in the middle of it is this baby carriage, and it doesn't make any sense at all. And so your expectations are completely thrown. Oh, well, wait a minute, maybe it's about a baby. I don't know. And now you're back to this bleak landscape again, and you're completely thrown. You don't know what's going on. And the music starts in. Now, the music is, is written, scored, and orchestrated in a call and response to what Paul is going to say. So right now, so you've got the music that's very full. You have to be. It dips down, awesome. not with a mix, but with the orchestration when Paul talks. Just going to buy a farm and start a dairy farm it makes no sense. It's too hard. So there's this connection between the music and the, and the voice. And the I don't know what success rate is, but. And Paul is talking about this defeatist, you know, it's impossible to do this. The odds are completely against you. Now this is not connected to any narrative at all. And then there's the dead calf shot, which is incredibly powerful. And it's not connected to a narrative still. You don't know what's going on. But if you can quality. not be distracted by that and, and now he said, be a quick enough study to figure out it. what's important, and so you're thinking, well, then is he actually going to try to do this? You might make it. Now look at this. This is negative space in the composition that then moves across. So the subject is all the way over. You have all this empty space, which makes him seem incredibly vulnerable. It's all bright and cheery. But we added the wind in. So it sounds like that, that dust bowl of the depression. And I never wanted to use these colors, but it was the only way to get this information across. And again, with the wind and the look of the building, you feel, oh my god, this is what is this? This is you know. Are they ever going to be able to do this? So let's go ahead and stop that for a minute. And maybe we can get the lights. Now, in the music, one of the things that they did in uh, Thin Red Line that was really interesting is that the music is, the composer used these themes that would cross over each other and nothing ever resolved. Because in the story, the character's fate is never really resolved until they die. So, you know, we started thinking, well, maybe that's what we could use here. So I talked to the composer and I said, you know, first of all, we had been playing with a lot of different music. And what seemed to work the best was acoustic instruments. You know, uh, we tried guitar and uh, we tried putting in some cello and some violin and it got a little too precious. As long with, as if we stayed with indigenous acoustic instruments. 
except for banjo. You always want to stay away from banjo. Uh, it kiss works. of death. <laughs> yeah, it's a kiss of death. Is it really? I didn't yeah, know that. Just, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hoedown time. So. <laughs> um, so I said, you know, we have write a score that has these themes that go in and out but never resolve, which is exactly what's happening with the score. And it adds to that sense of impermanence. Now, all these things are going on. You'll never notice them, but you feel them. Uh, let's go to, let's see. Let me see what this is right here. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's do the Pick a uh, number. first no, uh, 33.47. <laughs> okay, let's try it right here. Now, this is, um, this is the first milk pickup. And it is coming um, at the, um, it'll come at the end of the first third of the second act. Um, and up until this point, the scene that we're going to see, you've seen the farm family. You find out what it is they're trying to do, why they're doing it. You see the farm family struggle through getting the farm up and going and, um, and you know, spending time with their children. They're living the life that they wanted to live. They're very happy about it. You know what? Let, let's go back and play this scene because I just want to show you. Hey, Vince, this. you want your egg? Let's go back. Can hey, Vince, come and eat your egg. egg. Sure. Of this. You know, we were talking a little bit about. That's a good play. That's a good start. Start right there. Hold on. Stop it. Pause it. Yeah. You know, I was talking a little bit about. If you slow the pace down a little bit and watch things happen and watch people's expression, that's where the drama is. And that's where, you know, in those details I get really excited about. And so this is a good example. This is uh, Paul is fixing breakfast for the first time. So let's go ahead and hit the lights. Turn up a little bit. Okay. I'm going to make your French toast. Okay, honey. Uh, you better come out and help Daddy. I think I might be messing this up. Hey Vince, you want your egg? Hey Vince, come and eat your egg. I know, but it's edible. I'm done with my eggs. Want this? Look, Darren, I'm done with my eggs. You're not interested. You want this toast? No. You want French toast? No, okay. Your piece is coming. Yeah. So, you know, again, the shots are held for a certain period of time. There's a certain rhythm to the scene that we're editing to that was dictated by the way it was shot. Um, now, that scene doesn't have anything to do with making a farm or the drama that went on, but it is about these people spending time with their family. And that's an important part of the story. So, um, now, at the end of the first part of the second act, I mentioned that um, you know there's um, uh, the milk pickup. Now, what we what we found out there there are three milk pickups in the course of the film, and the reason they're important is because that's when they get their money. You know, the dairy pick picks up the the amount of milk. They say how many gallons there were, and they give them a shit for how much money they're going to make for the month. Now, what we found in an audience screening is that you'll see there's the truck that backs up to the milk house that's going to unload the milk. And one of the audience members said, you know, when I saw that truck, I just knew, you know, that maybe they made it, maybe they didn't. So we ended up using that as a motif, that every time we had this pickup, which is an important event in their life, we used the truck. Um, so there are a couple of things I want to say about this sequence that you're going to watch. 
What we're going to see is Phyllis is talking to her mother on the phone, or grandmother on the phone. Then the truck is going to pull in. They'll pick up the milk. Paul then comes out, washes out the tank, goes back inside, and they pay their bills. Okay? So let's go ahead. Let's play this through. Yeah, we've been really lucky, Grandma. We've had a lot of help. There's so many people supporting us. It's great. <laughs> And now, now I don't have an easy life, but I have the best life. I have the best life. And it's okay, it'll get easier. But now I'm doing everything I want to do. And so, it's all good. I'm, I'm living it up, Grandma. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It's getting easier every day now. They're going to start picking up milk from us on Thursday. Uh, yep, this is the first milking we're going to get some money for. <laughs> Hooray! It is. It is. It's nice to know. And bye, Grandma. Love you, too. Bye. What's uh, that payment, Billy? Twelve seventy a month? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> What's our mortgage payment here? Here? I don't know. We haven't made any yet, so we don't know. 180 payments. So it's 1055. Does that sound right? Initially, yeah. And so then, the first five years is one thousand fifty-five dollars fifty-five okay. cents, right? Yeah, that's right. Do you remember the rate on um, the uh, line of credit? Line of credit. We owe about ninety-two on okay. that. I would say. Um. Uh, the building we owe about 90. What did we borrow? 96? No. Well, we borrowed everything we could. Yeah. So what did you come up with over here? Right now, expenses are more than the income. In rough math, 4,000, 5,000 shy a month. There is no money. There is no money. A third of no, let's keep going. Of our expenses are feed. If you got to buy all this grain, you're in deep trouble. You got to feed your way to profitability with protein off your own farm. That's the key. What we're going to do is keep pushing, and by the end of July, we'll know where we're at.
watching them now for about a half hour, okay? And we understand, we understand why they're doing this. We've watched them really hard to get the milk house up and running uh, and gone through all the problems that they've had with these various vendors. And this is a moment of reckoning. This is actually the first time in the film that uh, they're sitting down and figuring out how and what's going on with their finances. And it happens at 30 minutes in. Now, it actually happens at 33 minutes in. But 33, take, 47. But if you take three, <laughs> if you take three minutes off for the, for the uh, teaser, it happens a third of the way into the story. This is your very first major conflict. Yes? Quick question. Was this their first time of farming and yes. I mean, growing things? Yes. Or, oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. So what we've seen up to this point is a very, very quick learning phase of them overcoming all kinds of obstacles. And now the cows are producing, now they have milk in the tank, and now, you know, we're seeing that. Now, you know, while they're doing that, um, telephone conversations are a lifesaver. Because the great thing in documentaries about telephone conversation is you have the character telling somebody else what's going on, which means they're telling the audience what's going on. That's so good. Let's, let's hold on right there. The other great thing about telephone conversation is that you can actually film it from behind so that you can't see their mouth, which means you can take the entire conversation, edit it in any way you want to. Okay, so the telephone conversation is incredibly helpful. Now, I could have stayed over the shoulder and never shown her mouth, but to help sell it, I came around to the side as she was finishing up the conversation and could see her speaking on the phone. Now, you know, one way of editing this would have been her saying, you know, yeah, and they're coming on Thursday and it'll be our first milk up and yeah, milk pickup and yeah, we're gonna make some money for sure. Cut from there straight to the truck, which is that's that's a very legitimate option. Mm -hmm. But what I ended up doing is I stayed in the scene, coming around, and you're watching her, you're watching her mouth up on the phone, and it really, it sells, the, it sells the shot. You know, if you had any doubt that it's not real. Now again, these are all very subtle things. These are not things you're thinking about. It's things you feel. So while, while they're trying to solve this, so the truck, what we found is that as I said, the audience was responding to this truck coming in. And to them, that set up a sense of anticipation, which is great. I mean, that's an emotion that the audience is feeling. So we ended up using it. Every time there was a milk pickup, we had the truck come in. Now, unfortunately, I only filmed two pickups. And the rule in comedy and drama is three. You know, two never sells a joke. It's always got to be three beats. Two never sells a drama. It's always got to be three. So in three, there are three pickups. I only had two shots. So we actually took one of the shots and reversed it. And it actually worked. That's not in the scene, though. Now, one of the ways that we ended up structuring this as we were going through is what they're doing is a little technical. They're working with machines. You see this tank. Um, during the course of the film, the audience is very slowly introduced to all the machinery as they're learning it. So in the very beginning, you see Phyllis working on trying to master the milk pump. And then she's not very good at it, but the next time you see a scene, you don't see the entire milk pump, you just see a piece of it. And she's a lot more confident. So by the time we get to the scene in the milk house, the tank, you already understand, that the milk machine milks the cows and it brings it into the tank. And so when you actually look into the tank and you see white, you understand that's milk. Now, in their world, milk is the way they make money. So when we did our color correction, what we did is we actually enhanced the tungsten light inside of the, the milk tank to make it look like gold. Because for them, that's what it is. It's liquid gold. Oh, yeah. I was wondering why it was so, it looked like it was full of urine or something. <laughs> <laughs> little, little in, in a proper <laughs> screening, it actually looks gold, <laughs> not, not like cow piss. Now, the, the scene of them going through their bills, 
the way that happened is I, in the beginning, was living in the back of the single wide trailer. How long did you stay there? Uh, eight months. Solid? And, no, I would stay for a week and leave. <laughs> Solid. And, and come back. I would take a week off between visits. Because on a film like this, the only way that you're going to be able to get that kind of intimacy and the only way that you're going to be able to take all the mundane things that happen in the course of the day and turn it into drama is if you're there. Mm -hmm. So it means total immersion with your subject matter. So what kind of camera were you using? It was um, a JVC GY110, which they don't make those anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Mini DV, right? Mm -hmm. Was it Mini DV? No, 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 it was tape. Um, Mini yeah, Mini, Mini, Mini digital. Digital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the bill paying scene, what happened is I was sleeping in the cubby in the back of the, um, of the trailer, and I hear them out in the front, and it's only about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. The sun had not come up yet, the, but the sky was starting to get light. And I walked out and saw them, and I immediately went back and got my camera and came out, and the first shot that I made was the last shot of the scene, which is a long shot. And then I moved in and start and you know, camera on the shoulder, I didn't say hello, we all knew what the rules were. And they were going through their taxes. They were they were actually preparing their tax returns. Um, because it was the only time of course of the day that they had the time to do it. Now, you know, what do tax returns do? It doesn't really do anything for us. As we're putting everything together, we thought, well maybe we can get the audience to think that this is some kind of bill settling. So we actually then, the way the sequence was structured is Phyllis is on the phone with her grandmother. They're, they're coming to pick up milk on Thursday. We're finally getting paid. Then you see the truck coming in. So you know what that truck is. You know, and the milk pickup, you know that that has something to do with them getting their paycheck. Then. Paul comes out to clean the tank, and by this time you know what that's about because you've seen it in the film. Paul comes out, and you, you know because of that shot that it's either early in the morning or late at, or in the evening. And it's a transition shot from that milk pickup. You don't really need it, but it actually helps establish some geography. Then you come inside with them going through these papers and talking about their loans. So you automatically assume that they're basically paying their bills and tallying up their checkbook. And then Phyllis says, so what did you come up with over there? And we pulled Paul from an interview saying, you know, he was talking about where they were financially in an interview that I did later. And he said, yeah, and right now it's, we're shy about four or $5,000 a month. We added that in as a response to her question. And then, you know, equalized so it sounds as if it's all part and parcel. Then we pulled out to the wide shot, and then it segues into Paul's voiceover. And then it goes with his voiceover out to the field, and it's that um, disconnected voiceover again. Hmm. I'm just trying to see if I can open it with a different, with quick turn or with something okay. else. Okay. Well, uh, you know what? Are there any questions? I mean, I've, I've got, it's a shame we're having trouble here because I have a whole series of things that we could talk about, but you kind of get the gist. Uh, are, are there any questions? So overall, did you say already that what you set out to do was accurate to what actually ended up being the same message that you envisioned might come about is actually the story? No, I could not have been happier. I mean, I was so lucky. And I think that making this kind of film is very difficult because you really are putting yourself at the mercy of the gods. I was so lucky that so many different things worked out and it turned out to be exactly the film that I had in mind. Uh, in the end, even though there are a lot of things that I could go through with you here and show you how we changed things in order and we made some things seem to be what they weren't, uh, when I showed it to Paul and Phyllis, they burst into tears. They just said it was the it was the experience that they had that first year. So yeah, I was I was very very happy with the way it turned out. What year did you film? I started in two thousand seven, and I finished in two thousand nine, I think. You're still filming. 
Oh, they're still farming. That's that's a very interesting story that um, they're, they've changed their business model. They started out with a 19th century art, artisanal business model, which is making uh, a craft for a very niche market, a quality craft for a very niche market. And now they're still doing that, but it's not as profitable as it should be. So what they're also doing is they've, they've uh, bred uh, a whole herd of cows that are pasture-based, and they're selling that genetics. And they're working as consultants for other uh, farms that are trying to do the same thing. So they've, they've gone from an artisanal to a 21st, uh, 19th century to 21st century that involves not only artisanal, but intellectual property as well. And what I think is really interesting about that is being a farmer is about looking at your product, looking at the market, and being flexible enough to figure out some way that you're going to, you know, shave the edge and make a little bit of money. That's exactly what they're doing. Also, they're franchising. Yeah, so because these people were your friends and you knew them so long, did you have to try to box that in your brain when you're, I mean, would, be, would you be filming something and say, oh, wait a minute, they're, they're going to look silly in that scene, or yeah. oh, he's going to kill me when he sees this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did you yes, have to force that away? Yeah, I did. Uh, and the, the way I did it is that I, um, I knew that I was going to be in control of the editing. So no matter what happened, I was going to film it unless I felt that it was dangerous. If I told Paul and Phyllis in the beginning, if they felt uncomfortable with me filming something, all they had to do was say the word and I would stop. But I, because I knew that what was on tape really didn't necessarily have to go on the film, I filmed everything. And I mean, you know, there, there are scenes with Paul and Phyllis, they're arguing, there's you know, all kinds of stuff uh, that some of it appeared, some of it didn't. But uh, I, I never didn't film something because I felt it put them in a compromising light. I was able to put that in a separate box. Yes? How do you, after you've gone through this whole process and now that it's, you're showing it's getting out, how do you feel as a filmmaker do you feel about going through this process again? Do you feel like you, have, you want to make more films, whether documentaries or fiction as a director, or do you feel like it, it's, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, as a producer, I've had a chance to work with some amazing, talented directors, all of whom have a very unique visual stamp. Could I direct a movie? Yeah, I could direct a movie. Uh, could I direct a movie as well as Wes Anderson? No way. 